Genesis is a wonderful book. It's the book of the beginnings. There are many beginnings. Beginning of creation, and then the history of the world. When you read Acts 17, Paul's message to the uh, leaders in Athens, he gave a very nice overview how this great God is the creator God, he is also the great leader of the universe. He's in charge. He upholds the whole universe. How great he is. And he is the one who let the nations go on their own ways. Like after the flood, you see how God uh, let the nations go on their own ways. Genesis 10 and 11 gives a whole picture of that. And then it ends with Babylon. That is the religious world without God. And then God called from that environment Abram. He was an idol worshipper. And we have seen that the last time when we read Genesis 15, how God had a plan with Abram and how God encouraged Abram not to fear. Genesis 15 verse 1, where God said, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. So Abram had to learn to go his way with the Lord under his protection and also counting on his reward, his promises. That reminds me of Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 is such an important book, dear friends. Hebrews 11 shows what faith really is. And so Abram uh, saw way ahead. He saw already the millennium before him, and through faith he made it his own. And so that's what Hebrews 11 shows, uh, what God has in mind, faith accepted, and faith is going to work it out with God's help. So Abram was called by God, and then he had to learn to trust God. Uh, we see in chapter 15, this great God, who is in control of the whole universe, who brought Abram out of Ur of the Chaldees, in verse 7, to give him the land of promise to possess. We've seen a little bit that covenant that God made, based on that sacrifice, and that Abram really walked with God. In 15 verse 18, it says on the same day, so that was the day of that sacrifice, we see that the Lord made a covenant with Abram and he extended that to his seed and he connected that with the promise of the land, the promised land from verse 18 to verse 21. It's amazing. And that's still future. And so faith looks ahead and makes these things that are future its own. And that's the same for us, dear friends. Through faith we look forward. And we, through faith we make what is future a present reality. Faith also is putting trust in God, not in self. And we will see that in chapter 17 in a few moments. Faith, it says, is the evidence of things not seen. So it gives a conviction. Moses saw the God who is invisible. And so Abram also saw the God who is invisible. And he, this God became a reality for him. And it gave him conviction. Conviction to go out of the idolatrous environment. To give the conviction to go and travel all the way to the promised land. He had to put his trust in God. And when you study these chapters, it's amazing how God promised Abram very special things in Genesis 12 already, seven promises, and how God uh, was going to work these things out. But if you study that in detail, you see how Abram also failed. Abram is just like us. We become believers, and then we think everything is rosy and dandy, and then we find out how we are failing people. And you know what is so beautiful in Genesis 12? Where Abram failed, he went to Egypt, he even denied that Sarah was his wife, was his sister, that's a half-truth, of course, but a half-truth is something worse than a whole lie. And so Abram was there in Egypt, put his trust in his own thinking, but then God brought him back. In Genesis 13, he brought him back to the place of worship. You know, Abram is seen as a worshiper in this book. He's the builder of altars. Genesis 12, two altars. Genesis 13, at the end of Genesis 13, he built an altar 
after God had shown him his plans for the land. Abram was an, not only a builder of altars, he was a worshiper. And that is what God has in mind for you and me today. He drew us from this world to have us for himself, to be a people for himself, to be worshippers. That's what God's looking for. When the Lord Jesus was talking with the woman at the well in John 4, he explained a lot of things to her and connected with her need. But then she started to ask questions. What about worship? And then he says, the Father worship, uh, the Father seeks worshippers. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That is what the Samaritan woman had to learn. That's what we have to learn, to really trust God. And when we go back now to Genesis 17, I just want to give you a little bit of a connection. In Genesis 12, we have the call. Abram responded to that. But in Genesis 15, we see then how Abram uh, had to learn to put his trust in God when he said, I'm your shield and your great reward. So Abram really had to put his trust in God who would lead him on. The great creator God who is in control of the universe, all those stars, it's an amazing thing. And he had to put his trust in God. And that's the same with us, beloved. We need to put our trust in God. Now what did Abram do? After these promises, he said in Genesis 15, I'll give you a son. Um, he will be your the heir, because Abram didn't have a son. He had a servant, Eliezer, faithful servant, and Abram wanted him to become the heir. God says, no, I will give you a son. And... Then God also showed that his uh, seed the, the, uh, after him will go through difficult times. So that's why he said, not only look to the heavens, your seed will be like the stars in number, so shall your seed be. And Abram believed God. Verse 6, 15 verse 6, Abram believed God. That means really he said amen to God. The word Amen comes from that root word, belief. He put his trust in God. So that is what he did. He put his trust in God. But then, he didn't have a son. Sarah was uh, sterile. And so they started to think, what can we do to help God a little bit? And so what we see then in Genesis 16, we didn't read it, but in Genesis 16, Sarah came up with a brilliant plan. Just take the servant girl from Egypt, Hagar, and you take her as the concubine. And if she gift, gets a son from you, then I adopt that son for myself. And then he will be our heir. Brilliant plan. They didn't even pray about it. It was so brilliant. That was a custom in those days, you know, uh, in the society. You could do that. Nobody would say think anything wrong about it. But what was wrong about it? It is they put that trust in themselves, what they could do. Abram was still able to father a son, and Sarah, who was sterile, she would then adopt that son for herself, but it didn't work out that way at all. If you read Genesis 16, and I encourage you to do that in detail, you see how it caused a lot of trouble, this whole situation. And so there was jealousy on behalf of Sarah when uh, Hagar got pregnant, uh, and Hagar started to despise her mistress. And so there was a lot of flesh there. The flesh is always there. And the flesh is at enmity with God. Also my flesh in ourselves. The flesh that we have in ourselves is at enmity with God. That's why we need to learn to judge what's of the flesh. To set it aside. And we'll talk about that in connection with the circumcision uh, in a while. So Abraham had to learn an important lesson that his own good intentions could not fulfill God's plans. And that's the same for us. The good intentions do not uh, realize God's plans. If we put our trust in ourselves, then we will, and we work hard to 
please God, it won't work. And you know, there's a, someone who went through that process. He describes it in Romans 7. You read Romans 7, and you see how Paul learned to put his trust. I'm not only saying, talking about you, I'm talking about the Apostle Paul. <laughs> he had to learn to put his trust in God. Now you read Romans 7. He worked hard. And when you can compare that with Philippians 3, you see how he was a masterful man. He was very talented, but he could not fulfill God's plans in his own strengths. It took God's intervention. In Romans 8, you find God's intervention when the Holy Spirit takes over. That is the end of the flesh. But the flesh is still there. And so this is a battle, this is a conflict that every believer is has to deal with. This battle between the spirit and the flesh is very real. And it will go on till the rapture. But God wants us to give the victory. He wants us to be under the control of the Holy Spirit so that the flesh will not rise its ugly head, but that the Holy Spirit may lead us. And what does the Holy Spirit do? He always introduces Christ. He always wants to set Christ before us using the scriptures. The Holy Spirit makes the word of God real. And so if we put our trust in this great God, then we can move forward. And that brings us then to Genesis 17, where we have read that Abram was now 99 years old. It's pretty old. He ultimately became 175. So it was not the end of Abram's story yet. <coughs> but what is important at this moment, God appeared to him in verse 1, I am. This is the great I am. And what does the great I am say? I am the Almighty. Now, in Genesis 14, when Abram met Melchizedek, Melchizedek was the king of Salem, but also the priest of the Most High God. Genesis 14, 18. The Most High God. You know, there's only one who is the Most High, and that is Jehovah God. That is this great God who is the Most High. And when you read Isaiah, 13 and 14, you see there was one who wanted, was very jealous, that is Satan. Satan wanted to be like the Most High. Satan is very smart, but in his thinking, he was very stupid. How can you be like the Most High? There can only be one Most High. You cannot have a second Most High. So that was really wrong thinking, and that led to his downfall. You can read Isaiah 13 about that. But here, my point is, Abram had to learn to put his trust in this most high God who is in full control of the whole universe. But also the DNA code and all the small things, everything is in his control. And so Abram now had to learn that this most high is also the almighty and the two go together because the Most High is the one who will do what He wants to do. Not what I want, but what He wants. The Almighty is one who will realize His plans. It does not rely on my strengths or my uh, intelligence. It relies on Him. But we have to learn to put our trust in Him. And that's why God says to Abram, in chapter 17, verse 1, I am the Almighty God, walk before my face. So that means, realize my presence. You are in my presence. The word walk, in the Old Testament, or the New Testament, implies our lifestyle. It implies what we are doing. It implies our actions. But it implies really everything. And that walk needs to be perfect. What does that mean? In tune with Him. In fellowship with him. You know the Lord Jesus said. Uh, in Matthew 5. At the end of the first part of the Sermon on the Mount there. Uh, that his father. My father is perfect. And he says to the disciples. Now you must be perfect as well. So that is not 
uh, it doesn't mean absolute perfection. There's only one who is absolute perfect, that's God. We, we, we cannot be absolutely perfect. But what we can do, we can walk in tune with him, in fellowship with him, in agreement with him, accepting his authority, accepting that he is really in control. And so that word perfect implies also integrity. It means that you are not trying to walk for two worlds. You don't walk for this world and at the same time for God's world. There is this integrity that means this focus. You focus on him, on him alone. That's what Paul learned in Philippians 3. If you make some notes, you study Philippians 3. And there you see how Paul was learning important lessons. He had tried to serve God in his own strengths. He was perfect as far as the law was concerned. But then when he met the Lord in the glory, then everything changed for him. And so that's now what the case with Abram here. Abram, uh, he meets this God who is the Most High, but also the Almighty, and who says, walk before my face and be perfect. That is where a new chapter starts in Abram's life. And that chapter is so important, and I refer to Paul also, the Apostle Paul, when he turned that page from Romans 7 to Romans 8, when he learned to see that I need to put my trust in God, in the Holy Spirit, in the Word of God, and not in my own thinking, not in my own strengths, then the Holy Spirit could take over. And that is the point here with Abram, that he had to uh, really walk in the presence of God. Now, I'm not saying that uh, that we are now as Christians just like Abram. What I'm saying is we learn important lessons from Abram. Abram is the father of all believers. In, the, in a strict biblical sense, we cannot call Abram a Christian because the Christians had started only after the Lord Jesus had come, after the Messiah had died, rose again, and went up to the glory and sent the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, you find that the Holy Spirit came, and from that moment on, the believers became Christians. Why? Because they were anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came on them. So there is a difference between Abram and us. But there are also parallels in that sense that we can learn from Abram as a child of God. Uh, the lessons he learned in God's school are also lessons for us. Now, when we become believers before God, in Christ, in Yeshua HaMashiach, we are perfect already, positionally. Everyone who comes to the Lord to be saved and put his trust in him, that person is perfect in God's eyes. Not because he's all of a sudden so much better. No, because God sees him in Christ. If um, A very simple example. If you take a letter, you put it in an envelope to send it away. The envelope covers that letter. Now, so it is that God sees us in Christ. We are in Christ. We are covered. So God sees only Christ. That's how God sees us. And in that sense, we are perfect positionally before God. Now already and for eternity. And that's, you, re, you learn that in Hebrews 9, for example. But then to work that out practically, to be practically perfect with God, that is the challenge for us. And Paul learned to do that. In Philippians 3, you see that he says in Philippians 3 verse 15, where he spoke about this... Um, New position in Philippians 3, verse 15. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. The point is this, this positional perfection that we have in Hebrews 9 needs to be worked out practically. It's a matter of our attitude and that's why I said earlier, this integrity that was needed. Abram failed in integrity. There was a mixture between what he could do in his own strengths and what God wanted him to do. But this integrity implies that you are really in tune with God and in that sense, perfect. Now that is the practical perfection that Paul is speaking about in Philippians 3 verse 15. Let us therefore as many as be perfect. That is the right attitude that is this integrity, that is this right mindset.
<coughs> and that we connect then with this circ matter of circumcision. Okay, we'll come back to that in a moment. But God said then, to go back to Genesis 17, that he would make a covenant between Abram and uh, and also implying his seed, his descendants. And that seed would be a multitude. That's why God said to Abram, I was, I'm going to change your name. In Genesis 17 verse 5 we have read, Thy name shall be Abraham. His name was Abram, means exalted father, referred back to his own father. But now God wants Abram to see the connection between what God is going to do. Abraham means father of a multitude. God says, you have to see what I am going to work. Not think back to your own father, but see who I am. Now, at that moment, Abram didn't have a son yet. He had a son, Ishmael, but it was not a son that God would want to give through Sarah. Abram and Sarah didn't have a son yet. And at that moment, God said, I want you to be circumcised. In verse 11, we read that earlier, and that's the foreskin needs to be removed as a sign of that covenant. So that means Abram, all the efforts that he could produce, he had produced a son. All those efforts could not stand in the presence of God because that those efforts of the flesh would interfere with what God was going to do. Yes, we will see uh, later in Genesis how Abram was able to uh, have relations with his wife at this age and that she who had always been uh, sterile, who had passed the age that she could conceive, that she would conceive. And you know, that was so strange. If you think about it, humanly speaking, that is absolutely impossible. But that's why Abraham had to put his trust in God the Almighty. God does what is impossible. And that's what Abraham had to believe. That's what Abraham had to do in his uh, faith. Put his trust in this great God who, is, who can do the impossible because he's the Almighty. He's not only in charge of the whole universe. He can also give a son to Abram, who is the old to father the son, to Sarah, who had passed the age that she could conceive, but on top of that she was always sterile. So that's totally impossible. And that is why it is so important to see that Abram put his trust in this great God. He believed. And in Hebrews 11 you see that Sarah also believed. Uh, when you read Genesis 18, when Sarah heard about that, she started to laugh. When uh, Abram heard about it, we have not read it, I think, but in uh, Genesis 17, verse 17, when Abram heard that God said, you're going to have a son through Sarah, then he fell on his face and started to laugh, because that is impossible. But God is the God who, of the impossibilities, who make what is impossible possible. And you know, that is what Abram learned, and that is what we have to learn. If you turn with me to Romans 4, in Romans 4, uh, the Apostle Paul refers to the example of Paul. Romans 4, we read in Romans 4 that Abram is our father, so that's the father of the Jewish nation. But we also know that Abram is the father of all believers. We find it somewhere else. But my point is now uh, a little bit further in Romans 4, where Abram became the father of all believers, as I said earlier, not only of uh, Jewish descendants, but also of people. Uh, in verse 11, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised. So Abram was not circumcised yet, but he put his trust in God, and God said, now I give you a seal, a confirmation of this, you need to be circumcised. And as the circumcised, he became the father, 
of them that believe. So he was the father of the circumcision in verse 12. And he was also the father of the believers from among the circumcision in verse 12, who follow Abram's example. But Abram was also an example for all those who would believe in God, just like Abram did in his uh, uncircumcised condition. Now, not the point of the greatness of Abram's faith in verse 17. Romans 4, verse 17. As it is written, I have made the father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. So Abram put his trust in this almighty God who can make things happen, who can make things that are not life alive, who brings them to life. And that is the kind of trust, the kind of faith Abram had. This is, from a human perspective, total nonsense. But from God's perspective, that's exactly what we need to do, to put our trust in him who quickens the dead, who brings the dead to life. Sarah's womb was like that. Abram uh, had passed the age to, gener- to, uh, to have a son. And so from that perspective, he was also dead. But God is able to give life in that condition. And just a little side note here, for us it was the same. The moment we believed, God brought us out of this spiritual death in which we were. You read Ephesians 2 verse 1. We were dead in trespasses and sins. But God changed that through faith. When we put our trust in Him. I can't explain it. This is a work of God. And beside that, what happened in Romans 4 verse 18 He believed against hope. He believed in hope. So that means from a human perspective, he could not father a son. Sarah could not get a son. That is against hope. But he put his trust in this God and so he became a father of many nations. If you've read in Genesis 17, that was God's promise. And then Romans 4, 19 being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. That's what I mentioned earlier. From a human perspective, he was not even able to uh, generate a son like he had done with Hagar. He was too old. Neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So that is the condition in which they both were found. From a human perspective, it was not possible for them to have a son. But he was not weak in faith. It means He trusted God that God could do this. And in verse 20, he staggered not at the promise. So he was not wavering. But what he did, so unbelief, he was strong in faith. So God empowered him. God gave him the strength of this kind of faith. So he was not marked by unbelief, like initially he started to laugh when God was talking about it. But now he had faith. And not only that, he gave glory to God. In the end of verse 20, notice this. He gave glory to God. And that's an important element for us also. If we see that God is doing the impossible, then we can give glory to God. And the seventh point is in verse 21. He was fully persuaded. This conviction that goes together with faith, as I mentioned earlier, this conviction leads to this persuasion. He was persuaded that he that had promised was able also to perform. When God says to Abram, I'll make you the father of many nations, Abram put his trust in God because he realized that God was going to perform what he had promised. So that's the seventh point of verse 21. And these lessons that Abram had to learn, we have to learn today, dear friends. And that is why we have to learn the, that the flesh needs to be set aside. I mentioned earlier Romans 7. You study Romans 7. It is too long now to go through that in this session that we have. But Romans 7 shows exactly this conflict between the old nature, uh, the flesh, and the Holy Spirit in us, or the new nature. The new nature in itself has no strength. But what we see in Romans 8, 
The new nature is then invigorated, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and then things can fall into place. So when we surrender to God, when we realize that in ourselves we have no strength, then God can take over. And that's what we find in Romans 8, with the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what we find also in um, Philippians 3. I mentioned earlier Philippians 3 as an example for us, but I just want to read Philippians 3, verse 3. That seems to be difficult, but I'll try to explain that. Philippians 3, verse 3. There Paul says, we are, and that means all the true Christians, we are, Christians taken from the Gentile background, Christians taken from Jewish background, we are, all the Christians together, the true Christians in Christ, seen in Christ, we are the circumcision. What does that mean? Circumcision means the flesh set aside. So this action in Abram's foreskin, that a little piece of foreskin needs to be removed, that is a symbol, it illustrates this point that the flesh needs to be removed. And that can only be done in the, uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit, not through our own strengths. Some people want to crucify themselves or they want to do all kinds of things to remove the flesh. It won't work. It takes the activity of the Spirit of God and of faith at the same time, of course. And that's why Philippians 3 is so important. We are the circumcision. That means we are believers who have learned to see that we cannot put our trust in ourselves, but we need to put our trust in God. And as a result, I mentioned earlier that Abram gave thanks. That is in Philippians 3, not only giving thanks, but he says, worship God in the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit will then lead us on to serve God as worshippers. And that goes together with this point that he mentioned and have no confidence in the flesh. So, we rejoice in Christ Jesus, we boast in Him, that is our activity of worshippers, but at the same time, it's an ongoing exercise to not put confidence in the flesh. Philippians 3, 3 is really a key verse in this. So when we go back to Genesis 17, we have these instructions there, how God uh, showed Abram what he needed to do, and then God connected this promise of this everlasting covenant. So God commits himself forever. This expression everlasting covenant is found 16 times, I think, in the Old Testament. The idea of a covenant is that God commits himself. He commits himself to Abram and his descendants. And in the New Testament, we see how God has committed himself to the believers he has given the Holy Spirit to all the believers, and in that sense, God has committed himself to us forever and ever. Now, Sarah, it's an important point also in verse 15, we see that Sarah's name also was changed. She was called Sarai, my princess, and her name was then changed to Sarah, princess. And so, that is also to emphasize now that Sarah was going to be an instrument in God's hand for God's glory. It's a beautiful uh, title, a beautiful name. And God says in verse 16, I will bless her and I will give the son also of her. So that is that impossible thing that we were talking about earlier. God is going to do that. He says, I will bless her and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall be of her. So that is why this name Abraham is so important. He became the father of many nations, of, men, of a multitude of nations. Of course, that is still future. You have to see the long-term plan that God has, even in the millennium. And in the meantime, as we have read in Romans 4, Abraham also became the father of all the believers from among the Gentiles. So God has wonderful plans. And from a human perspective, is not possible. That's why Abram fell on his face and laughed in verse 17. Shall a child be born to him that is 100 years old, and shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear? And so he pleads for Ishmael. But God cannot give that promise in connection with Ishmael. God gives a promise. He says in verse 20, 
uh, I will bless him and make him fruitful. You know, Ishmael, God has plans for the whole world, also for the, um, the Muslim world. But the point is that the fulfillment of God's thoughts cannot come through Ishmael. Um, if you want to take a note, you read Galatians 4, and you go home and you read Galatians 4. In Galatians, Paul really speaks about the battle between the flesh and the spirit. And he shows very clearly that the two cannot go together to fulfill God's plans. And so this is important. Yes, God has a plan for Ishmael, and in the, in, in the present world, they have a great role. And we can see also, Ishmael is a really a illustration of Israel after the flesh, even today. They do things in their own strengths. Magnificent. I mean, I'm not putting anything down. But God's plans can only be fulfilled in the millennium when they will really surrender to the Lord and be led by the Spirit of God. Then that promise, I will establish my covenant for an everlasting covenant for his seed after him, that will then be fulfilled. And God has a plan. And that is why it's so important that Abram put his trust in God. We did not read those verses, but in verse 23, Abram took Ishmael, his son, and all who were born in his house, and all who were bought with his money, every male among the people of Abram's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin. So we see here Abram's obedience. We see also Abram's leadership. And this lesson that Abram had to learn, we have to learn, but Saul of Tarsus had to learn, became the Apostle Paul, he had to learn these important lessons, and that's for us today. But I want to emphasize also, it has this link with the world to come, when God will fulfill his plans for this earth, through his earthly people, but we are now a heavenly people. You see that also, that Abram's seed is, connect, is uh, compared with the stars, whereas the, his seed is also compared with the sand of the sea. So there are two aspects of Abram's seed, a heavenly and an earthly aspect. And today, the believers taken from Jews, from the Gentiles, belong to that seed, that heavenly seed, and also have a blessing for this earth. Now, um, I want to give you some homework. If you take Galatians, read it carefully, especially Galatians 4, you see how these matters are uh, also relevant for us today. Paul speaks about that, uh, that he wants to give them second time birth. What does that mean? The Galatians had accepted the gospel through Paul's ministry. In the second journey, when he was in present-day Turkey, we find that in uh, Excuse me, his first journey, he was in Acts 13 and 14. He was in that area. He went back later and the third time later. But these believers in Galatia were very precious for Paul because they had left paganism, they had left Judaism, and now they were for the Lord, working and living for the Lord. But immediately the enemy attacked them. The enemy wanted to bring them under the law. The enemy wanted to bring them... Uh, in a, in a condition so that they would not be happy, they would quarrel, they would bite each other, just like this conflict that uh, that we saw earlier between Sarah and uh, Hagar. There were all kind of things. And so Paul says in Galatians 4, I want you to, I want to give birth to you a second time. He had given birth to them when they became believers, but then he says, and that's why he said, you read Galatians 4 in detail and you, see, you find that for yourself, how important that point is. Paul wanted to give birth to them a second time. Why? He wanted that Christ would be great. I will just read that key verse in Galatians 4, where he says, My little children, verse 19, My little children. So he's speaking here about to the believers who have become children of God, and Paul looks at them as his own little children. And he says in verse 19, Of whom I travail. So if a mother gives birth to a child, she's in travail to give birth to that child. And so Paul had gone through 
very great difficulties. You read in uh, Acts 14 how he was stoned to death and then was brought back to life and then he continued his gospel ministry with, um, with Silas who was with him and Timothy and he continued on. And then he reached Derby and Iconium and uh, Lystra where the area where Timothy was. Timothy's grandmother got saved. His mother got saved. And then through them or Maybe also directly to Paul, we don't know for sure. But Paul speaks about Timothy of his as being his own child. And so my point is, these people became believers, but now they were under the attack of the enemy. The attack was he wanted to uh, place something beside the Lord Jesus. He wanted to uh, distract them. This, uh, this sincerity, this integrity that we walk in the light with God, the enemy is always attacking that. And so Paul is now in travail. He wants to give birth a second time that Christ may be formed in you. Galatians 4.19, that is so important. He was like a mother in travail a second time so that Christ would be formed in them. So they were already believers. But now Paul was so much concerned about them, he wanted Christ become greater. And that's the desire the Lord has for each, for each one of us. He wants that Christ may become greater. That Christ may be formed. This word formed is morphe. So that is a formation. God takes his time to form Christ in our lives. He takes his time. Some of us are very young in the faith. Some of us are much older. But God is at work in each one of us. He is forming Christ. He wants to see Christ and nothing else. So God is at work through his spirit, also in each one of us, to to do that. And Paul was very much exercised about it. That's why he was in travail. And so we may pray for one another. We may be an example. But it will not be easy. But God is faithful. God is going to fulfill his plans. God is the one who is in full control. And so may we may the Lord help us that we may put our trust in him. Just like Abram did, like Sarah did, who initially didn't believe, but then believed also, Hebrews 11. And then we can learn these important lessons. And then you go to Isaac. Isaac means laughter. And so then you can rejoice. Paul wanted to rejoice in these believers in Galatia. He wanted to bring them in the full enjoyment of this joy of fellowship with the Lord and with one another. So may the Lord help us that we may enjoy this fellowship with Him. When the Lord will come, perhaps today, then we will be ushered into this fellowship with no hindrance, with no shortcoming whatsoever. In the meantime, we have this challenge to walk in the light, to walk in the in connection with this truth that we have seen about circumcision, that we don't try to build something up in the power of the flesh, but that we walk in faith. And so may the Lord help us to be true worshippers, true followers of Abraham. Yes, we are failing people, but the Lord is going to help us when we put our trust in him. Praise God. For him, yeah. Thank you. We always look forward to having you with us. <coughs> I understand the next time you're with us is when Gideon goes to on his tour. Is that correct? Probably. Yes, <laughs> Lord willing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. Okay. Now I wonder if uh, Ben and Jerry can come back up again and call and have some more songs and then. Uh, next one.